Uh, I'm Norbert Gleicher, MD. I'm the medical director and chief scientist at the Center for Human Reproduction here in uh, New York City. I'm also the president of the Foundation for Reproductive Medicine, a guest investigator at Rockefeller University here in New York, uh, and a professor adjunct at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Vienna University School of Medicine in Vienna, Austria, uh, where I actually started my medical studies. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today and uh, to talk to you about why and how to supplement androgens in infertile women. Uh, but before uh, I really get started, uh, I need to point out uh, my conflict statement uh, since it really reflects uh, to a considerable degree uh, on the subject today. Uh, I am uh, a co-inventor on quite a number of patents uh, in the area of androgen supplementation, uh, particularly with DHA, but also with other androgens uh, in uh, fertility treatments. Um, I personally feel that my presentation will be objective, and I hope you will agree. Um, but it is important that you keep in mind uh, these potential conflicts. I am uh, also a shareholder in a company uh, that produces uh, a DHA product, uh, and I receive royalties uh, from that company. Um, finally, I have uh, quite a number of other patent applications and pending or already received in other areas that are unrelated. Uh, upon completion of today's webinar, uh, anybody uh, who is participating should be able to explain the rationale for androgen supplementation in selected women with infertility. Important to point out that androgen is obviously, like any other medication, not for everybody. Uh, you will hopefully be able to identify who to supplement and who not to supplement. You will know how to supplement uh, with androgens correctly, because as I will show you, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of supplementation is done in incorrect ways. Uh, in other words, I will explain to you what not to do when it comes to androgen supplementation. Uh, and uh, finally, we will conclude uh, by telling you what uh, your expectations should be uh, for androgen supplementation. Uh, so, androgen supplementation in uh, infertility has remained a highly controversial issue. Uh, indeed, uh, there is not a single authoritative body uh, like ASRM or ESHRAE or any other uh, society that has so far endorsed androgen supplementation in women with infertility. And that is actually quite curious uh, because androgen supplementation has become widely used all over the world, and I will come back to that. Uh, recent estimates um, indeed suggest that at least half of all IVF centers in the world currently utilize one or another form uh, of androgen supplementation. Uh, from our own experience here at the Center for Human Reproduction in New York City, I can tell you that we have seen a dramatic shift. Our center is a last resort center. In other words, a large majority, over 90% of patients who come to us have previously failed IVF cycles elsewhere. And uh, we have seen a dramatic shift over the last five years. Well, uh, five years ago, less than 5% of our new patients came to us already being on androgen supplementation. And now over 60% of our new patients, by the time they arrive at our center, already have been uh, on androgen uh, supplementation. Uh, therefore, a, a real dramatic increase uh, in androgen supplementation seems obvious. 
Uh, the most uh, disturbing finding, however, in all of this is that we, we find that over 70% of these women uh, who come to us with a history of androgen supplementation really received uh, androgen supplementation in, in very incorrect ways, and I will come back to that as well. So why the controversy? Why, if there's such a, a use for, for androgen or such recognition that androgen supplementation may be helpful, uh, why uh, is it still so controversial? And the principal reason is, or the principal reason given by those who uh, claim that there is no evidence in support of androgen supplementation, that there are no well-designed uh, prospective clinical trials that show effectiveness of androgen supplementation. And uh, this is yet another point that we'll be coming back to in a moment, but this is a correct argument. And uh, one has to uh, acknowledge that there are no such studies, uh, but we have tried uh, on two occasions and have not succeeded in recruiting patients and other studies uh, that have been published, uh, some showing, some not showing benefits, uh, were really all universally inadequate in a number of ways, not the least uh, because it is so difficult to recruit women with low ovarian reserve, who are the primary target for androgen supplementation, into clinical trials because they feel that they do not have the time for three to six months to potentially get the placebo. Uh, but that is not the only reason why uh, this has remained such a controversial issue. Another very important reason, very frequently overlooked, is inappropriate patient selection. As I already stated, uh, androgen supplementation is not for everybody. You obviously don't give aspirin uh, for headache to somebody who doesn't have a headache. Uh, and therefore, uh, androgen supplementation to patients who don't need androgen supplementation will obviously not give you positive findings. So as a prerequisite, for androgen supplementation, you need to know that uh, your patient has low androgens and therefore needs androgen supplementation. And paradoxically, uh, there was really no study that, that uh, I am aware of uh, that really monitored androgen levels uh, in patients uh, who uh, received supplementation. And finally, uh, because of nonsensical treatment protocols, uh, and by nonsensical, as I will show you, I am principally, uh, in principle mean two things. Uh, androgen supplementation needs to be given ahead of a cycle, and I will explain in a moment why. Uh, and it needs to be given ahead for at least six to eight weeks before cycles start. Uh, and secondly, uh, androgen supplementation is very easily uh, counteracted if then the stimulation that is used in a subsequent IVF cycle is inappropriate. And uh, any time you use in your stimulation protocol something that is suppressive for the ovaries, you basically counteract the effects of androgen supplementation, and unfortunately, that is happening all the time. So, uh, so far, the introduction, and now, what's the rationale for androgen supplementation? And the rationale was probably best documented in a 2010 study by Aritra Sen and his... Uh, chief of section uh, Hamas, at the time uh, they, they were still, I believe, in Texas. Uh, they since relocated uh, to the University of Rochester. But what these two investigators demonstrated in mice uh, through a beautifully designed androgen receptor knockout model what effects androgens have on follicle maturation? 
Uh, and again, I'm pointing this out uh, because it was the first time that we, and I believe the rest of the world, started to understand why androgens are really of such crucial importance uh, in the follicular maturation process. And what these investigators showed here, one of the figures from their paper, is that when you when you uh, look at um, uh, ovaries that are negative for androgen receptor versus ovaries that are heterozygous for androgen receptors, uh, you see a peculiar uh, pattern of follicle growth, primordial follicles. Uh, primary for follicles, preantral follicles, antral follicles, and then uh, mature follicles. And what you see, and all of this refers to the androgen receptor in granulosa cells that uh, basically there is no difference in percentage of follicles that grow between um, knocked out uh, 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 androgen receptors and, and, and present androgen receptors. And what you see is that uh, only at the preantral stage do uh, we start uh, starting from the preantral stage, do we start seeing significant differences in uh, follicle numbers? And it doesn't matter whether we are looking at uh, four to five weeks or later, but you see it mostly in four to five weeks follicles. And what that suggests is that if there is no androgen action through the androgen receptors, starting at preantral follicle stages, we end up getting much, much fewer follicles if we prohibited androgen activity by knocking out the androgen receptor. Now, again, important that this is happening at small antral stages in other words, very early in follicle maturation. Why is that important? It is important because it means that follicles at these very early stages still require at least six to eight weeks until they reach gonadotropin sensitivity and therefore if you give androgen supplementation only during your IVF cycle, you are not hitting uh, the follicles that you are using in your IVF cycle. If you're giving androgen supplementation only during your IVF cycle, you're hitting follicles or you're treating follicles that will become available in IVF only six to eight weeks later. In other words, you have to pre-treat for at least six to eight weeks, and I will come back to this point. Now, <clears throat> it is very obvious from looking just at, at the histological pictures uh, that uh, you can see how different the ovaries develop uh, in mice uh, with functioning androgen receptors or with knocked out androgen receptors. And I don't have uh, the time uh, to, to go into any further details, but it is also important for you to understand that these investigators in parallel also looked at androgen receptors on oocytes, for example. And in those, uh, they did not see any significant differences between animals <clears throat> Uh, who had uh, the androgen receptor knocked out and uh, wild-type animals. So 
what this basically demonstrates is, or what this basically demonstrated for the first time, is why androgens were important, and more importantly, at what stages of follicle maturation androgens were important. For us here at the CHR in New York City, uh, this paper was really eye-opening. And the reason was what we have come to call the DHA story at our center. And the DHA story is best represented in this slide. And what this slide really, oops, what this slide really demonstrates is that um, this was in 2004, in other words, roughly six years before the mouse paper I've just shown you was published. Uh, in 2004, I had the opportunity in this office, where I'm sitting right now, uh, to sit across from a then 42-year-old, very intelligent woman, she was a lawyer and a banker, who at age 42 plus wanted to freeze her eggs. And we, of course, were not in favor of that and strongly recommended against it, but she insisted on it. And so we did one cycle, more or less, to convince her that this didn't make sense. And as we expected, we got only one egg and one embryo that was frozen. At that point, we had another serious discussion, and I basically refused further treatments. Uh, but she really literally begged on her knees for one more chance. And we gave her that one more chance, and the patient in the following months suddenly produced three eggs and three pretty good-looking embryos. And what you then see on this slide is that this patient, month after month, uh, went through stimulations. We obviously couldn't refuse her anymore and literally months after months produced more eggs and more embryos. Indeed, uh, after her sixth consecutive cycle, uh, where she had produced uh, 13 eggs and uh, nine beautiful embryos, by now at age 43 already, she came smiling into my office and she said, Dr. Gleicher, I have to tell you a secret. We, of course, by that point, were scratching our heads what was going on with this patient. The secret was that she had started taking DHEA at that point. And she had started taking DHEA because I had told her we would not do another cycle after her second cycle unless she produced more eggs and embryos. And so she had gone to the literature uh, and she had discovered quite a number of papers that had alleged improved egg numbers following certain remedies. Uh, the only drug she could put her hands on without telling us was DHEA, because in the U.S., for peculiar legal reasons, it's considered the food supplement, and therefore it's available without prescription. So the reason she started DHA and not one of the other medications that she had discovered as a potential uh, enhancing uh, agents, the only reason she took DHA was because she could do that without getting a prescription from us. And you can see what happened afterwards. And we indeed in those last cycles had to restrict her stimulation because she had developed classical PCOS-like ovaries. And we were actually concerned about hyperstimulation because she produced uh, as many as 18 eggs in her eighth cycle. So this is how the DHA story started at our center. And uh, we uh, immediately tried to do a prospectively randomized study, but couldn't recruit. And uh, we then also uh, moved the financing for this study to European colleagues who claimed uh, that they would be able to do that, but they also couldn't recruit. And so we had to rely on 
studies of lower evidence levels, and they were usually matched control studies between patients on and off DHA, which in those early days where we did not yet give everybody at advanced ages DHA supplementation, these kind of studies were possible. And I don't have the time to go into the detail of all of these studies, but I will show you at the end the references. But what we showed in those studies, all controlled, though not prospectively randomized, that DHA appears to improve egg and embryo numbers in patients with low ovarian reserve, seems to improve egg and embryo quality, improved spontaneous pregnancy rates, meaning pregnancies while patients were just taking DHA for six to eight weeks, we suddenly started seeing spontaneous pregnancies in patients who you would have never expected it, and in surprisingly reasonable numbers. We saw statistically improved IVF pregnancy rates. We obviously saw improvement in time to conception. And all of this uh, also obviously improves cumulative pregnancy rates. Uh, and those are references, as you can see, between 2000 and 2007, uh, we published uh, quite a number uh, of papers uh, on this subject. Now, this slide demonstrates the effect of DHA over time on AMH levels. Uh, this representing older patients, this representing younger patients, and the middle line combining both, and you can clearly see that uh, over time, DHA improved MH measurement. It did not show the same thing for FSH, uh, and for many reasons uh, that should not surprise, not the least because FSH is obviously dependent uh, on quite a number of other uh, agents, not the least estradiol levels. Uh, a very interesting thing happened uh, in 2008 uh, when um, a colleague from Toronto, uh, Ed Ryan, uh, who runs a private fertility center in Toronto, Canada, and was one of the first to start using a DHA supplementation after our initial uh, publication. He suddenly sent me the dump of all of his data uh, of DHA supplementation over a number of years. Uh, and we combined our data, uh, and this was, as I said, in 2008. And what we were able to show in the combined data that patients uh, who received DHA in comparison to the national U.S. rate reported to the CDC, starting at age 35, had significantly lower miscarriage rates, suggesting that DHEA uh, reduces miscarriage rates. And the, the, the decline in miscarriage rates dramatically increased in relative percentages uh, starting from age 35 into older ages. And the decline was so remarkable that we concluded that the only possible explanation for that could be that uh, there was a negative, uh, or I should say a positive, a declining effect on miscarriages due to improved uh, improvements in aneuploidy rate. And so we looked in those days with old-fashioned FISH methods, also published in 2010, uh, and indeed were able to show that apparently DHA supplementation uh, really significantly uh, reduced uh, the number of unemployed embryos. Again, in those days, uh, those data were based on the three biopsies. 
Now, I showed you uh, initially as a rationale for androgen supplementation and the remarkable work of Sen and, and uh, his then uh, boss. Um, and after their paper appeared, we made contact with them and it was the beginning of a very fruitful and still ongoing uh, collaboration uh, between our laboratories. And what basically started happening is that erythrocin in the mouse kind of repeated the experiments that we had witnessed in vivo in our patients. And what you see here is, again, going back into the mouse, antrophollicle count, you have here the percentage of follicles just with pure FSH uh, uh, stimulation. And those, apropos, were older mice. Uh, here you have what happened to the follicle count uh, with, sorry, with uh, FSH, and DHEA stimulation. And then we blocked androgen with an anti-androgen flutamide, and you can see that that reduced uh, the follicle count once again. In other words, this was while uh, Aritro did his initial experiments with testosterone, this was in the same mouse model uh, a repeat of what we had done by this point uh, for four or five years uh, in our patients in an in vivo uh, situation, confirming what we expected. And so what this led to is our understanding that testosterone uh, was really crucial at the granulosa level, a granulosa cell level, and the granulosa cells obviously provide the nutrition or the nutritional support to maturing uh, oocytes in the follicle, and that this process mostly happens through the androgen receptor, and it leads uh, through androgen synergism with FSH to improved sensitivity towards FSH, AMH, AMH expression increases, which also may have an effect on recruitment because AMH uh, is obviously involved in recruitment and follicular survival. As a consequence, we're getting more eggs during IVF and probably more importantly, better quality eggs. As I already mentioned, uh, we tried twice to do prospectively randomized studies. Twice we failed because of inability to perform, uh, uh, to obtain appropriate patient numbers. We, still, we simply couldn't recruit enough patients and neither could our European colleagues. That doesn't mean that there are no studies in the literature. Why is it out from Israel also in 2010 reported the prospectively randomized study claiming improvement in outcomes and live birth rates. But when you look at the numbers, uh, they are really not to be taken seriously because with 17 and 16 controls, uh, any statistical claim has to be really considered uh, kind of being a joke. So what, what can we do if you can't perform clinical trials? There's uh, obviously extensive data on this question in the literature because roughly 95% of all medical practice as we do it currently in all areas of medicine is not based on clinical trials. There are obviously other levels of evidence uh, that also count. And if we cannot do clinical trial, which is obviously the highest level of evidence, then you go to lower levels of evidence, and they are not necessarily uh, much inferior in many situations. What could they be? They could be animal experiments like the ones I've shown you that erythrocin uh, has been performing for a long time in mice. But then you can go to larger animals, and this is one study of British colleagues 
who actually repeated everything I have shown you in the mouse and demonstrated by Aritro in the mouse, they repeated that in the sheep. And lo and behold, they kind of confirmed every single of the observations that we had made in human experience in the adult sheep. In other words, if you cannot do studies at the highest evidence levels, there's nothing wrong in doing studies at lower evidence levels. And then to ignore those uh, is, in our opinion, not appropriate. And this is what has been happening um, from those who, up to this point, are representing the opinion that androgen supplementation really, uh, that there is no evidence in support of androgen supplementation. Now, I made the point before that it doesn't make, it doesn't give, it doesn't make sense to give aspirin for headache to somebody who doesn't have headache. And the same applies here to androgens. Why are we giving androgens to older women or to women with low ovarian reserve? And I'm showing you this slide because what we did here is we looked at testosterone levels in women with physiological ovarian aging, meaning uh, they were older than 40, or with premature ovarian aging, meaning those were younger women under 40, but they had diminished ovarian reserve beyond their age. And lo and behold, what we were able to demonstrate in this publication in Human Reproduction in 2013 was that both of these groups, whether due to aging or to premature aging, both demonstrated significantly lower testosterone levels. So those are the two main target groups. I will not talk about the rest of it because this paper also was the first one to give us a hint why it is that so many older patients or patients with premature ovarian aging uh, have low androgen. I can tell you in summary, but without having the time to go into detail, that in most cases, this relates to the androgen production from the adrenals, not the ovarian androgen production. In other words, it is the adrenal androgen production that becomes insufficient. And that is paradoxically good news because androgen is produced 50% in ovaries, 50% in adrenals, roughly. And if the androgen deficiency is ovarian, then that would mean that the ovaries are burned out. Supplementing those women uh, would not be very helpful. But if the androgen supplementation is insufficient because of adrenal insufficiency in androgen production, the zona reticularis, then supplementation helps the ovarian microenvironment and the ovaries kick back in and produce better and more eggs. Uh, just to show you this, um, what, you, what you see here is base and cycle start, and the white circles uh, represent uh, infertile patients who did conceive, the black circles represent infertile patients who did not conceive. And what you see both for total testosterone and for free testosterone is that the patients who conceived had actually at base, meaning before supplementation with DHEA, had lower testosterone levels than the ones that did not conceive, but they had much higher testosterone after they con uh, after DHEA start. So the delta in testosterone improvement directly predicted who would and who would not conceive. And as I said, this applied both to total and free testosterone. So what do we know so far? 
We know that ovaries need good androgen levels to produce good quality and quantity of eggs. And we know that women with aging ovaries usually are hypoandrogenic and therefore if that hypoandrogenism is adrenaline origin will benefit from androgen supplementation. And this is reflected in the physiology. When primordial follicles are recruited, they start developing FSH and androgen receptors as early as on primary follicles, more so on preantral and peaking at early antral. And this is very much in parallel what I have shown you earlier in Aritrosens, a mouse model. The same thing happens in the human ovary. And there is a feedback in granulosa cell that leads to the synergism between androgen and FSH. And just apropos, uh, also uh, IGF-1, meaning the active agent uh, in human growth hormone supplementation, works at exactly the same points and therefore like androgen supplementation, human growth hormone supplementation doesn't make sense just during the IVF cycle. Because if we are effective at these early stages in supplementing androgens, we are only in one cycle. But look, it takes three cycles at least to reach dominance and sensitivity to gonadotropins. That's why we have to pre-treat and why treatments just during IVF cycles for both androgens and apropos human growth hormone do not make much sense, even though, just on a side note, some recent data also suggests that androgens and human growth hormone may also have separate effects on the implantation process. So uh, we are uh, really treating these follicles here. And uh, this has a very uh, important general meaning for infertility treatment. Because for over 60 years, since gonadotropin therapy was invented by Gemzel and, and uh, Israeli uh, investigators, uh, since we started giving gonadotropins to stimulate uh, the ovaries, we really have been concentrating on the last two weeks of this long journey. The, the gonadotropin sensitive phase. Now, for the first time in over 60 years, we are giving treatment in the earlier stages of follicle maturation. And obviously these follicles still need time to reach the gonadotropin sensitive phase. So that's why it is important for you to pre-treat, not only to treat uh, during the cycle. And we pre-treat for at least six to eight weeks. We give DHA rather than testosterone directly because testosterone can also be toxic. In other words, too little testosterone is bad, but too much testosterone is equally bad, maybe even worse. And if you give DHA from which our bodies make testosterone, Toxicity, toxicity can practically not happen because every organ takes only as much DHEA to make its own testosterone as it needs. And therefore, you can really almost not uh, bring patients into toxic levels. So how do we control the process? Here at CHR, every patient undergoes or has a baseline androgen profile drawn before any treatment starts. And she will be uh, uh, given androgen supplementation only if her testosterone levels are low 
and to SHBG sex hormone binding globulin, which goes the opposite direction, is relatively high. We also monitor DHA and DHEAS. We monitor those because, not because we care, because both hormones are very inactive. They have very low affinity for the androgen receptor, so they, they therefore do very little themselves. But they allow us to judge whether the androgen deficiency is adrenal or ovarian. And that means if it's adrenal, you will see relatively low DHEAS versus DHEA because this is the only androgen which is exclusively produced only by the adrenals. Everything else is produced by adrenals as well as ovaries. DHEAS, therefore, is very important for us in determining the origin of the hypoandrogenism, just as it is in PCOS patients in determining the origin of the hyperandrogenism. If androgens are considered low, we supplement with 25 milligrams of DHEA three times a day. We then retest after four to six weeks. If the patient at that point is in normal levels, meaning her SHBG that was initially high has also declined, that's when we start uh, an IVF cycle. And when we start the IVF cycle, it is of crucial importance not to do things that will negate what you have done in supplementing with androgens. Meaning, you don't want to suppress already suppressed ovaries. And in summary, that means no long agonists, no antagonists, and no birth control pills. Our standard protocol for women with low ovarian reserve, therefore, is a microdose agonist protocol. And even though I do not have time to talk about it, uh, since we now uh, uh, use what we have come to call the HEAR, the highly individualized uh, egg retrieval protocol, uh, we very frequently use nothing because we retrieve these patients now at much smaller uh, follicular sizes. Let me conclude uh, by referring you to a paper we recently published uh, in Reproductive Biomedicine Online. It kind of summarizes uh, our experience with older patients. And I think this paper is particularly important because we, in this manuscript report, are probably the two oldest uh, pregnancies achieved, or the oldest women who achieved pregnancy with use of their own eggs ever reported in the literature. Both were literally days away from age 48 when they were transferred. One of the two had a healthy baby since. Uh, those are extremes, and obviously the older the patient is, the harder it will be to help her to conceive with her own eggs. At the same time, however, uh, as I sit here, I have to tell you um, that I'm convinced um, that were it not for androgen supplementation, those women uh, would not have conceived their children. Thank you very much. Uh, those are the members and collaborators uh, who, in one way or the other, uh, have contributed to the work I have presented to you. And uh, I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you.